Hello, everybody. This is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes. complaining and thank now it's goodness back. all five numbers were there and now you yep. are fully prepared and I, I expect nothing but perfection from you today oh well, that's that's the norm so that's fair obviously hey obviously. I'm super excited to record today because <laughs> why don't you tell everybody about how you rescue animals I do rescue animals uh-huh tell them about your latest endeavor I was trying to go shopping last weekend, and I was about to get in the car, and then I look over. We have new neighbors, two houses down. Well, I probably shouldn't specify that. And I see, like, what could be no older than three-month-old kitten, just, like, wandering underneath the cars, trying to eat wasps and stuff like that. I'm like, Jesus, what am I going to do? Like, I, it does not feel responsible to just leave you out because you're too little to be by yourself so I like walk over to it I just shouldn't have walked over there but you didn't know you thought it was a stray cat I thought it was a stray cat like this is a baby cat but it was hilarious because as it was unfolding I was getting all these Marco Polos like look what I found it's happened again how does this always happen to me then I get a picture of what is obviously the cat's mother and you're like whoops this might belong in this yard. And then you're like, I think I sold this cat. <laughs> like it was no, I, I don't think it's, I actually don't think it's, his, I don't know if it is his mom. I really wonder. I don't know. But like, anyways, they're like, oh yeah, it's our cat. Like we keep him in the backyard. I walk by the backyard gate fully open. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Terrible. But I mean, it explains why, like, I wonder now, like were the squirrels just in the trees was the rooster just on a farm? Like how you guys find so many injured animals? Like maybe they're just like in normal places and you're like, oh, you come with me. No, no, we get them from rescues. I, I, it'd be nice if we didn't have to pick all these ones up. <laughs> you're, you're just a magnet. Yeah. Remember the, remember the iguana who just like appeared on the chicken coop? Yeah, I can honestly say I've never even seen an iguana outside of a pet store. Like the fact that That's that it just fair. was in your yard is unbelievable. I know. I was like, I just remember, like, is that a dinosaur? <laughs> What's happening? But I like the idea of you just like going around taking animals out of people's backyards and being like, not good enough. I'm gonna take that. Mm. Da- I'm gonna take that animal now. <laughs> Yeah. I think that's another comic book series you could do, like Maybe. your normal vigilante justice and then your animal vigilante justice. Oh, I feel like the animal one would be more intense, actually. Well, I agree. Hmm. Yeah, especially if Chris is involved. Yeah, gosh, I hope that kitten is okay. <laughs> Me too. It did have a home. You thought it was a total stray and you were going to do the right thing. I and take did. Care of I was it like, and... maybe, maybe it's theirs because they did just move in and like suddenly there's a two month kitten here. But I'm like, come on, come on, y'all. It's just little. Yeah. Just yeah, little. it is. It was, it was very cute. It was, but we don't need another cat. No, because you already have three cats officially now. Well, until someone wants the third one. Which is you. You're the one who wants it. So why don't you roll into your tea review for today? All Please right. tell me your well, tea is current and not 10 years old. <laughs> well... Oh my gosh, what is that? I tell you that. Uh, actually, it says trademark 2019, so that's not bad. Trademark? Um, or uh, copyright. So I... That's not great. It's not great, but it's better. The, the, the other one was like 2016. I mean, I guess that's not that far apart, 2014. So I'm a little under the weather today, so I... Oh God, I hate this. I, I haven't tried it in a while, maybe since 2019. It's called Throat Coat. It's a famous one. Oh, yeah. The, you uh, talked about that when mm-hmm. we did our episode with the Reverend and the Reprobate. Yeah. You don't yeah. love it. No. So it's it's Traditional Medicinals is the brand, uh, a gr- organic throat coat. But this one is special because it has 
slippery elm in it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So the herbal power supports throat health, <clears throat> which I need. Oh, man, it really, time, timely coffee. Yeah, I know. The taste is sweet and silky with a distinct licorice taste. Your Ugh. favorite. Well, I think by silky, they mean slippery, and licorice yeah. is disgusting. I love licorice, but not in my you drinks, would. actually. Yeah, and the plant story is that the slippery elm tree has played an important role in Native American herbal medicine. For hundreds of years, inspired by its traditional use, we source our slippery elm domestically, where families collect the bark sustainably by hand to protect the trees for future generations. That's impressive. Okay, so the best, I just found the best diffused by date. It's a little expired. It's fine. Just by a year. You act like this is amazing to me because... I have a you lot of have tea. more tea than you've ever had in your life because people send you tea now that we do I know. this podcast. And you're like, let me use this as an opportunity to clean out my shelves with expired tea. <laughs> well, I want to keep it different. Because I have a mm. lot of like sim like I have a lot of versions of a chai, you know, like caramel chai or like Kolkata chai, all those different ones. I'm trying to figure out where they I think it's in California that they grab it. Anyways, all right. Uh, and you steep this tea for 10 to 15 minutes. So. Dang. That's going <laughs> to coat the throat for sure. Sure will. Here we go. So the smell is extremely licorice with a Ugh. hint of maybe it's the elm. Like it smells a little wintry. That's weird. Okay. We're going for it. Oh, Ooh. fuck. <laughs> yeah. I remember this tea now. <laughs> it does... Coat the throat. Like, it doesn't lie. Like, it's intense. <laughs> I think the Reverend Reprobate said that the same company makes the mu- the milk mothers, mother's milk yep. tea. Mother's milk, yes. Not milk mothers. <laughs> and so they, they, like, take it really seriously. I don't think they really care about – they care about the purpose of the tea more than, like, balancing the taste. Right, right. So it's an herbal tea, but because you steep it so long, because it's so strong, it actually feels like it has a thick body. Like, yeah, it's like slime going down your throat. Yeah, that slippery elm. Exactly. Yeah, it feels exactly. very viscous. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Mm-hmm. You're really adding to this. Thank you. Um, and so that viscosity is, you know, hanging out on the throat, which is good. So I'll probably be I'll probably be in better shape for the podcast because of this. But it's really extreme. Like it, the the licorice comes in with a total like Superman punch, and then turns into slime and mm. melts down the throat. But yeah, I would give this a medicinal thumbs up. Like, don't have it casually. <laughs> Drink it with purpose. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like you have people over for tea and biscuits, and you're like, Oh God, I've got some fresh scones and a little bit of throat coat tea. Enjoy. <laughs> Awful, awful. Awful. But no, it does its job. It's it's impressive. Like a lot of teas like say they do a lot of stuff, but this one you can feel it right away. All right. <sighs> yeah. I'm ready to go now. Okay, let's go. Well, I'm very excited for today. Well, that means I shouldn't be excited. Actually, you're not gonna love the beginning or the end, but you're gonna really enjoy the middle. Okay. We s- these stories are like jelly donuts a little bit. Hmm. Like you're really gonna like really gonna like the center of this. Okay. So we've got two women for you today. Okay. They are not recorded as having interacted. You never know. But it's very possible once we get through these stories. It's very possible that they passed each other at some point. Like on the street or on a boat. We'll find out. On a car or in a moat. Oh. No. <laughs> but it, yeah, like I said, nobody recorded this, but there I didn't even mean for this to happen. So the first one we're going to talk about is Pauline Cushman. She was born Harriet Woods in Louisiana on June 10th, 1833. Oh, that's got to be a brutal time to be in Louisiana. Like if you don't have why? AC down here, you're just not moving in the summer. Like I yeah. understand why it's called the Big Easy. You don't move. Too hot. And imagine the smells. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Harriet's parents had come from France. Her father actually was born and raised in Spain, but then their family fled Spain and were taking refuge in France, and that's where her parents met. Harriet's grandparents weren't loving the situation that their daughter found themselves in, so they didn't approve of Harriet's father and that made her parents elope. So her parents elope and then they want to get some space from, you know, the judgment. So they came to America, they settled in New Orleans and her father set up a business as a dry goods merchant, which we've learned is way better than wet goods, right? Yes. That was the best one. Yeah. And he was pretty successful for a time, but then business started to change and he was struggling. And so they made a decision to move and he and his wife packed up the family, which they had eight children. The oldest child died on the way from Mm. France, but they had seven children who survived and Harriet was the only girl. So they pack up the seven and they go to Michigan, which there's not, it's not cities. No. It's not cities at this time. And they open a trading post. Harriet grew up with Native American children and her six brothers. I think what try, it was probably a Ojibwe try in Michigan. So Harriet becomes They describe her as a tomboy. She knew how to row a canoe. She knew how to ride Mm -hmm. a horse. She was a good shot. Like she has her six brothers. And if she is playing with children outside of the family, she's playing with Native American tribes who are, are you upset with the story or did you get some slippery elm? I had some slippery elm. Okay, good. (laughs) And they had also, the family had also brought her paternal grandfather with them. And so he's, you know, they're sitting around the fire at night. He's retelling stories of his war days with Napoleon. Oh, wow. And Harriet loved it. She was the most engrossed in these stories. And he always would say, it's a shame you're a girl because you would make an unbelievable soldier. I'm really identifying with her. Yeah, you're going to like her. So at 18, Harriet decides to move to New York. She wants to become an actress. New York. (laughs) She's song for the day. She gets there and she, you know, she struggles a little bit. She eventually meets a theater producer from New Orleans and she's able to start getting pretty regular parts and she's very talented. Oh, At that point, she changes her name to Pauline Cushman. That's okay. Yeah. Cause name. that's a big change. And also like, how do you come up with it? I wonder. Right. Exactly. And also, is Pauline Cushman better than Harriet Woods? I feel... I love Harriet Woods. I know. I was like, really? That's what you went with? But a different time. We don't know what's cool. Yeah. So from here on out, she's Pauline. Pauline's acting, you know, doing theater. In 1853, she meets and marries a man named Charlie Dickinson. He's a musician, not the writer. Okay. And they get married when Pauline's about 20 years old. They will move back to Charlie's hometown in Ohio. Sources say that they got married because Pauline was pregnant, but that that first oh. child is actually born, stillborn. Oh. But they stay married. They end up having two children together, Charlie Jr. and Ida, in 1858 and 1859 or 1860, depending on the historical record you're looking at. So they have two young children. Charlie's making money as a musician and as a music teacher, so they're not swimming in it. Yeah. But they're getting by. And then do you know what's right around the corner? Of what? Oh, right. Ida's born. Ida's born. Do you know their store right around the market right around the corner? <laughs> no, Ida's born in 1860. So oh boy. in 1861, here we go. Charlie enlists for the North. Obviously, it's, I knew you were gonna get obsessed with this. Charlie enlists <laughs> as a musician for the Civil War. Stop. His father, his uncle, his brothers all did the same. This is like my dad. My dad couldn't get drafted to Vietnam because his his eyesight was so bad, so he would go play. He would go do theater for, well, maybe that was the actual anti-Vietnam protest. Never mind. I don't want to roll that back. <laughs> but that's <laughs> a story mind. for you. Do not thank her father for his service. Let's no, move on. No, do not. <laughs> but, you know, he was definitely entertaining for the protesters. <laughs> Thanks for acting. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as a, as a musician, doesn't it seem so weird to be a musician <laughs> For the Civil War. <laughs> it was like the drummer. I, you know, like well, the you're whole... playing a, you're playing a flute <laughs> as you're calling it a drummer. I so know. that's the but first then, problem. You know, you know the Civil War time stuff with the with the marching. Then there's a snare drum and a flute. You're also playing the flute backwards. Uh, <laughs> what if I'm somebody, left-handed? You, I as somebody who played the flute, your hands need to face each other. Look up Lizzo for a second. How does that work? Your hands fit one, the front hand faces oh away. Oh my the, God, your wrists. I did clarinet, bassoon, trumpet. 
Doesn't matter. I, I'm sure the troops were happy for your efforts. So no, that was terrible. He's, he's, I think he's actually playing like a banjo. I think that's what he brought. Like he brought it to boost <sighs> love morale. Love a banjo, love a fiddle. Great. Well, you would have been really pleased <laughs> with this situation. So he's doing it to boost morale, but it's... And Steve Martin. It's the Civil War. So he's also having to be like a first responder and having to tend to wounds. And he's going to have to fight if it gets real ugly. Oh, my right? God. Pick a lane. Are we well, a medic? He- <laughs> are we an entertainer? Or are we a soldier? I don't think it's his choice. I don't think he's going there being like, I'm hoping the Civil War will really open up my opportunities. He's like, I know how to play music. I have a duty. I'm going to do it. And then he's like, oh, my God, everybody around me is dying. I better help some people. I think that's what's happening. Yeah. But. War is terrible. Awful. Charlie ends up being released after nine months because he's incredibly sick with dysentery. Oh, no. The poop everywhere. All the poop. Oregon Trail. Yes. The soldiers in his unit, just like many soldiers in the Civil War, they've been forced to camp on the battlefield and they have no clean water. Oh. They have raw pork, crackers, and coffee grounds that they just mm. chew. What? No. They have nothing to cook with. No utensils, no you know pots no. and pans. And they also are often not able or allowed to start a fire. Then you can't cook the pork. Because, hello. I'm, we're over here. Come find us. Yeah, just like in Lord of the Rings. So they're eating raw pork, Ugh. and they also don't even have—they don't even have tents. So, <laughs> with conditions like this, it makes sense that Charlie oh, gets yeah, sick. Yeah, totally. What state is he in when he gets sick? I don't know where he's located. He enlisted in Ohio. Right. So I wonder how I don't far know where south he, he got. I don't know where he was. Brutal with the rains. But according to. To PBS of the six hundred and twenty thousand love PBS military deaths that occurred during the Civil War, two thirds of those were from diseases, not actual injuries. <sighs> wow. Yeah. So Charlie goes home. He's lost fifty pounds, which he's a tall man. He's at least six feet tall, and he now weighs about one hundred and twenty pounds. So it was not on his goal tracker to lose. <laughs> no, he was. He's one hundred and twenty pounds and six feet tall. It was not That's his target weight. Terrible. Yeah. He's a skeleton. Yes. They move in with Charlie's parents because they have no way to make money or support themselves. No. Charlie. He probably has to wear a diaper. Okay. And Charlie is sick for months and he never recovers. He dies in December of 1862. That's terrible. Yeah. What a way to go. I know. I know. That's slow and painful. Death. It's awful. Really smelly. So Pauline now has two very young children. Yeah. She has no way to support herself except for acting. That's what she's really good at. So she makes a really tough decision. There's some tension between her and her in-laws, but she makes the tough decision. She knows her in-laws love her kids. So she leaves her children in the care of her sister-in-law and her mother-in-law, and she goes out on the road to make money. Okay. Because that's how you... She can't just wow. be on set, right? You have to travel around with the oh, show. Oh, man. So do we think this is selfish or selfless? I'll let you decide. Okay. Ready? So she ends up in Kentucky. It, within a couple of months, she's in a sold-out show called The Seven Sisters. And she has... Oh, like this constellation? It, yeah. She has a big part that requires her to have different disguises and different costume changes. And she's a main attraction. She's well-known. Can you imagine being famous at this time? Like your sketch is on like a tree. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they've pasted, a a, they've pasted a big piece of paper on the tree. They're like, Pauline Cushman in the Seven Sisters. Well, During this time that she's performing, she's staying at a boarding house and she's performing almost every night. She's approached by two high-ranking officers for the Confederacy, a general no. and a colonel, and they right. want her to make a toast to the Confederacy during her next sold-out show, and they will pay her $300 to do it. That's a lot of money. Wait, did we ever figure out what side Kentucky's on? So I did because I knew you were going to ask that. So Kentucky is technically run by the Union because they never switched to the Confederacy, but there are – it's very tense. There are a lot of people there. I'm sure it's super contested. Yeah, there are a lot of people there who identify. Yeah, it's – it's stuck there in the middle, so it's tough. So it is technically the union, but okay. there's a lot of people who feel differently at this time. Right. I mean, clearly the Confederacy is like flaunting about. 
Yes. So Pauline says, wow. let me think about it because this means that I would not be able to work. I would get fired and I would possibly be arrested for being a yeah. traitor. So I'm going to I'm going to sleep on it and I'll let you know. Now Pauline is not like a political voice that everybody knows about. She's just an actress and right. she's just a, a talented, beautiful woman who is doing her job. But she has opinions. So mm-hmm. right after meeting with these men, she goes to Colonel Moore, who is a union colonel, and she alerts him of the situation. She says, I was oh. just offered a bribe by these two men to do the following, right? To toast to Jefferson yeah. Davis, who is the president of the Confederacy. Yeah. And I don't want you hearing about it and thinking that I was interested. I do not believe in that. I am from Ohio. Like here's, she laid okay. it out. It's pro- I, this feels smart. Yeah, I think so. So Colonel Moore listens to her and he finds her to be very genuine, very authentic. Okay. And yeah. he says, I believe you. I believe you. Thank you for telling me. I want you to make the toast anyway. And she Why? says, are you insane? I'll be fired. I won't be able to return home. The North will, won't even look, no one will talk to me if I right. do this. And he says, yes, but the South will love you. And I want you to be a spy for me. Oh, my goodness. So. She doesn't she, want to. She does. She says, okay. What about her kids? I'll do it. So the next night, she's got a sold out show. The lights dim. Pauline takes the stage. She is representing the state of South Carolina. That's her role in the play. Okay. And so she says, here's to Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy. May the South always maintain her honor and rights. And it's just silence. Oh, boy. Like that awkward beat. And then the crowd erupts. And half of them are furious and screaming at her. And half of them are cheering. (sighs) So she's immediately escorted off the stage. Everybody in the production turns their back and won't speak to her. They're done with her. Yeah, that's fair. Totally. I would be the same way. And the next day, she's taken in by Colonel Moore for questioning, right? Like to make it look like she's in trouble. But I don't know what they did. They probably chit-chatted, probably talked about her next move, but he keeps her there. He holds her there. He tells her, all right, just pretend you're being interrogated. You're an actress. We can really yeah. sell this. Pretend we really <laughs> were rude yeah. to you and, and decided to let you go with a warning. But now you're going to be accepted by people who you weren't accepted by before. See what you can learn. Uh huh. When she gets back to the boarding house, she receives a letter. She's been released from the show. She's been fired. Yep. But the theater manager gives her a small severance because oh. he really likes Pauline. And she never forgot that because it meant a lot to her at the moment. He was taking a big risk and he didn't agree with her, but he liked her so much that he wanted to make sure she was okay. That's awesome. I mean, that's very kind of him. Which is, you never know. Right. Yeah. You never know. Even if you don't agree with somebody, like you never know what their true motivations are in, in in that moment. Like she was actually, he, I'm sure he thought she was amazing in a little bit. She just starts kind of running with the rebel crowd and oh, she's no. flirting with all the men and they're, t- they're just chit chatting because, you know, women don't have a mind for war. Yeah. So they're not, she's not gonna be able to retain any of these difficult pieces no, of information. Definitely not. Yeah. So she's learning things that way. She also utilizes her ability to disguise herself and she'll Ooh. put on some of her disguises and she'll dress like a soldier and she'll just go into public places and just listen. Wow. And she picks up information that way. Cool. Now, she discovers several things. She saves lives by discovering insider information. So she discovers how messages are sent. For instance, uh, often they're put in bags of flour. Huh. That's so cool. Also in false shoes, like in the a false shoe bottom. Oh. She also... Uh, she didn't even mean to really, but simply because she was seen as somebody who supported the Confederacy, the boarding house where she had been staying, the woman running it had been forced to allow Union soldiers to recuperate there once they'd been wounded. Oh, yeah. And she told Pauline that she was slipping them poison. Oh my God. Yeah, because she didn't want any more Union soldiers out and about. So she was 
killing them if they would come to her house to recuperate. And she just told Pauline that outright. So Pauline is reporting all this back. And immediately they stop sending Union soldiers to the house, but they can't blow Pauline's cover. Yeah. So they just they just don't send anybody there. And then they move Pauline and then they wait. They wait a good amount of time and then they go in and arrest that woman. So it doesn't look like it's in any way connected. But these are the kinds of things. And this is the kind of information that that she's getting. You don't hear a lot about like you hear a ton about spies in World War Two and even yeah. World War One a little bit, but like not Civil War. I know, I know. It's really neat. Yeah. So the Union sends her to Tennessee because that's super contentious, and then she comes up with this cover story that she's looking for her brother, who's a Confederate soldier. Which I don't uh, even know if that's true or not, because she does have a bunch of brothers, and it's possible that right, one but of them they were is in Michigan. Yeah, but they they were born in New Orleans, so who knows? Yeah. I don't know if where any of them ended up. You know, she was all over the country True. as well. But I, I might have just been a story. So with that, she's kind of traveling around to the different Confederacy camps and just doing her thing. Oh, I'm looking for my brother. Can you help me? And then yeah. the men are like, oh, you're pretty. Let me tell you things, right? That's right. basically the gist. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's basically it. That was That's her plan. Funny. It was working great. And... She had been told, do not write anything down. Just put everything to memory. She's supposed to put to memory, like, what their plans are, where they're located, where they've created, you know, like, fortifications to attack, things like that. So she is supposed to commit this all to memory, but she encounters a map of the Confederacy fortifications and she, some say she she draws a copy, some say she puts that exact Uh uh, map on her person and she stuffs it in her boot. I got a map of my boot. <laughs> Woody, is that you from Toy yeah. Story? And she starts to make her way back across Union Line so that she can report back and she's stopped by yeah. a Confederate scout. And he's really suspicious of her. Cut his throat. And she tries to run and now he's super suspicious of her. And so he Fair. takes her he takes her to General Bragg for questioning. General Bragg. Yeah, and he, he was like the big guy. And she sticks to her story. You know, she's just looking for her poor brother, but he does not believe her at all. And she's put on trial. Oh, no. And she is found guilty. No, where's the dude to help her out? Well, I mean, she's not texting, you know. How's, how are they going to even get the information, right? She's on her own. She's totally on her own, just riding the horseback. I can't believe she's done all this. She's found guilty, and she's sentenced to be hanged. That's terrible. So while she's awaiting her trial... No. It's quick. It's a speedy trial. While she's awaiting her trial, she becomes ill. Yeah. Obviously, right? Those conditions are terrible. Now, she is sick, but she plays it up, because she's a good actress, so that it seems like she's very sick. Okay. Which give, buys her a little bit of time. She plays it up like she is super, super ill and they can't possibly execute her, I guess, which is always a weird thing to me. Right. She's going to die anyway. Like, who cares? I know. But they, they do that. They're like, well, we can't do it till you're feeling better. It's so – it is a, such a weird concept. Yeah. So it buys her a little bit of time. And during that time, the Union Army drives the Confederate soldiers out of Shelbyville where she's being held. <gasps> The Confederate soldiers had talked about taking Pauline with them, but they decided she was too sick to travel, so they left her behind. And the Union soldiers came in, and they rescued her three days Yay! before she was sentenced to be executed. Yeah. That's awesome. But after that, her time as a spy is over because she's already well-known as an actress. That was kind of the whole point. Yeah. It's not – she can't really go undercover in any no, way. She was no. she was an actress, and that's what made her so appealing. So she's done. She's retired as a spy. She continued to travel and perform for as long as she could. She actually went back north, and P.T. Barnum, you know, circus man, huh. sets her up on a tour where she would dress in uniform and tell her own story of being a spy. Wow. Yeah. Sadly – both children died in childhood. They didn't they didn't survive. I, I don't know if she saw them again or not. I don't I don't think she did. Oh, that's really sad. I know. So she's performing for as long as she can and she ends up getting married in eighteen seventy two and she moves west, but her husband dies within a year. Oh jeez. So now 
1879. She finds herself in Arizona Territory, and she marries a third time to a man named Jeremiah Fryer. And they own and operate a hotel. Fryer's the sheriff of the town. They adopt a daughter. Aww. And they name her Emma. And then Emma dies as well. Oh, my God. I know. I told you. Cut you're not going like to like the ending. So I guess it would be her fourth, right? Because the first child was stillborn. She loses yeah. her fourth child. She just cannot handle the grief. She moves back to California. She's flat broke. She's destitute. And she's become addicted to prescribed opiates. The rest of her life, she's she's in Texas for a minute in 1892. She's doing things like sewing in exchange for room and board. She's really struggling. She attempts to get pension from Charlie's time in the service. Whoa. But she's denied. Why? How about her time in the service? Yeah, right? Why aren't they paying her? Yeah, she should be set up. Yeah, she's she's well, she's not fully denied. She's given a tiny, tiny amount retroactively for like a few months that he served, and that's it. It's not an ongoing pension. Okay. So it doesn't really help her. Man. She goes back to San Francisco and she's working as a seamstress and a charwoman. That oh. term again. I know. I looked it up what charwoman means because it's so weird. And I guess char is a, is derived from chore. So it's basically somebody who just does tasks for other people, like a chore woman. Huh. I wonder when it switched to like charbroiled obviously means something different. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. So sadly, Pauline died on December 1st, 1893. Her official cause of death was an overdose. Oh. And people wonder if it was possibly intentional. Oh. She was 60 years old. She was given a funeral with full military honors. That's cool, but they yeah. could have honored her actual life. Yeah, exactly. I think they could have helped her out. It sounded like she had a, like a pretty awful end half of her life. Like maybe, Agreed. like it is really cool, and it's cool when these things happen. But like, how about when it really matters? I know. I totally agree. And she's buried in the San Francisco National Cemetery, and her stone simply reads Pauline C. Fryer. Union spy. Huh. That's all it says. Wow. So what are your thoughts on Pauline? I think she's really brave. Right? Spy work would be so scary. Oh, we wouldn't last. Especially because there's no, like, there's no, like, it, I don't know, like, human rights laws and stuff. Like, shit can just get nasty real quick. And during, like you said, dur we've heard about it a lot during World War II, but during the Civil War... Like, yeah. What? <laughs> I mean, like you said, like for her to get information back, she's like, all right, got to get on my horse and travel a yeah. billion miles and hope There's nobody. There's no like telegraph or like, you know, Morse code. Like hope nobody attacks me. Hope I don't run into yeah. either side because the Union Army doesn't like her either right at this right. point in time. <laughs> hope she's not discovered. It's terrible. By the Confederacy. Like she, she's, I mean, super dangerous. Yeah. In addition to just being out in the elements, right? Gosh, yeah, I, man, she's lucky that she didn't get really sick from something. Yeah. Wow, what a woman. So we have another woman. Okay. Gonna like. Her name is Kathy Williams. So Kathy was born in Missouri in 1844, and her mother was a slave, but her father was a free black man whose name has been lost to history. Because her father was free, the only way that her parents could marry is if Kathy's mother was also free because it was illegal okay. to get married if he was free and she was not. She was not freed, and so they never married. So Kathy is born in this cabin in 1844. She's born into slavery. She's moved to Jefferson City around 1850. It's believed that that meant she probably never saw her father again. Hmm. Again, a lot of her details are lost to history, but it's yeah. likely that she also never saw her mother again. We Jeez. don't know for sure. And she would have been very young at the time. Her birth date, I said 1844, but her birth date also is not set in stone. But it's more than likely she was under 10 years old when she was moved. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Now, she's a slave for a family named, last name Johnson, and she works in the house for the okay. Johnson family at a super young age. But we know the Civil War breaks out, and William Johnson, the head of the house, he dies 
I believe unrelated, like just happens to die during that time. And Kathy stays on as a slave at the Johnson house. She's nothing changes for her when Hmm. William Johnson dies, but the union gains control of Jefferson (gasps) city. Yeah. Well, hold on. Now when this happens, Kathy is most likely about 17 and it's not as simple as, Oh, the union's here. I'm free. No, that's not what's happening not. because technically she is, but as a slave, she's considered contraband of the war. It's fucked up. So at the start of the war, there was no protection in place for slaves. Once the union took over a territory, they were often just returned to the plantation owners. What? Yes. But in May of 1861, three men, Shepard Mallory, Frank Baker, and James Townsend, were about to be taken by their owner out of state to help with the Confederacy war efforts. And they didn't want to do it. They're going to be separated from their family. Yeah. They're helping with something they didn't want to help with. So instead, the men decide to run to Fort Monroe, which was union controlled. The commander there, his name is General Benjamin Butler. He decided that instead of returning these three men, he would consider them contraband, which is property that would be used (sighs) against the Union. This appears to be a purely tactical move by General Butler. He simply did not want to give the Confederacy any extra manpower. This was not like an act of compassion. He is fighting a war, and that's, that's how he was thinking. I just want to frame it that way. But Lincoln goes along with it and passes the law in August of the same year declaring slaves as contraband, which means they are technically free, but they're also technically forced into helping the Union war efforts in some way. To call, yeah, to call them, I, I, that doesn't make sense to me because to call someone free and then to call someone contraband is like contraband is property. So exactly. Yeah. Figure it out, you dipshits. Yeah. So Kathy is a teenager and she is deemed to be a cook. And in her words, she was carried off, she said, with several other ex-slaves. Which, like you said, this seems like just a different slavery under a different name, right? Yeah. These women that were carried off, these are ex-slaves, black women being forced into war to do some sort of domestic labor for the Union soldiers. Mm. So women in these positions, it's dangerous. One, because of the conditions. We know about the diseases, right? Yeah. They're not, they're going to get the same diseases as the soldiers. They have to travel with the soldiers. They have to camp out with the soldiers, right? They're not at like base no. and taking care of things. They're on the road with them. They're so, probably being attacked all the time. They also, there's literal war going on. So there's, they get swept up in the battles as well. Yeah. Wow. Also, even in times of respite, they're at risk of being attacked by the Union soldiers. Several of these women, several of these women were sexually assaulted and raped. I'm sure all of them were all the time. So there's no way for us to know exactly what happened to Kathy, but I'm just giving you a rundown yeah. of what has been yep. reported by other women. Women in war camps are just generally awful idea. Not the women, but yes. treated awful, you mean. Yeah. So Kathy starts off as a cook, which she's also not happy about because she doesn't actually know how to cook. I, I think they assumed that she did because she worked oh. in the house, but <laughs> she didn't actually cook. So she doesn't know how to cook. That becomes apparent, and then they switch her to – She's a washwoman. So now she has to do the laundry. So like I said, she's going wherever these guys go. She can't leave because she's stuck in this geography that's very unsafe for her if she does leave. right? She'll immediately be in a southern state and have absolutely no resources. The only thing different about this situation is she receives a small allowance, which she didn't receive as a slave. That's the only difference. Okay. And over time, it's thought that Kathy actually w- was good at military life. Like she did well with like structure and she's and she was a hard worker, but nobody's saying that she wanted to be there. Like, right, right. Right. She was just good at it. She's sleeping on the ground like the soldiers. She also is in charge of her own wash equipment. So if a wagon wasn't available, she's having to carry these 25 gallon tubs, scrub boards, soaps, et cetera, Ugh. while she's marching along with the soldiers. Oh my goodness. She's also present for serious battles. We know for a fact that she was at the Battle of Pea Ridge, which is a significant battle, no, Butterfly Pea, which was a significant battle where the Confederacy lost two of their high-ranking officers and the Union took over the Missouri border. 
Kathy also, I mean, she's being treated like a soldier without any of the benefits. She also right. has to go wherever she's told. So they <sighs> move her to Little Rock for a minute. Then she's got to go to D.C. They they send her to get trained to be a cook. They're like really into this. She So she learns how to cook, <laughs> and then they send her back on the road. It's like, now you're a cook, finally. And she's having to travel. Imagine how awful it must have been to be a cook, especially in those times. Like, what are you cooking? The raw pork and the crackers that we just learned about in the previous story. So she's traveling all over the country. She would spend about three and a half years serving with the Union Army. That's a long time. Jeez. So in 1865, the war comes to an end and she's no longer contraband or a slave. And she returns to Jefferson City. Nobody knows why she returned to Jefferson City, but they hypothesize that maybe she was hoping she could find her mother or cousins or other family members, but she doesn't have many options as a female ex-slave. And so nobody's 100% sure how she supported herself, but it's, again, assumptions are made that she probably was a washwoman or a cook going off of the skills that she'd most recently been working with. Good thing she got that cook training. Yeah. But the following year, in 1866, Kathy learns that black men can now enlist in the army in their own units. To be clear, black men had been fighting all yeah. along, yes. for, forever. Correct. But now they can enlist and have it actually be a profession. People are just the worst. Again, I want to frame this. You know, this isn't uh, like, oh, this is what we should do because it's fair. The military was short on soldiers. Because so many people had died from the Civil War and they have real risks. They've got France and Mexico who are at risk at that point. They also are still trying to steal the West. So they're constantly fighting with Native Americans. But in the fall of 1866, Kathy Williams thinks, eh, I can do this. (gasps) And she enlists in the U.S. (gasps) Army as a man. Oh! William Kathy. Ah. She just switches her name. Now, this is against the law. She's breaking the law by doing this. But she states that she wanted to make her own living. And she needs to sell this because it can't be discovered that she's a woman because, like I said, she's breaking the law. But at that time, it's so ridiculous. At that time, women never wore pants. So if you had pants on, they were like, you must be a man. That's it. Like, it was just so easy. It was so I I think of like I love Lucy so when like stupid. they wear like terrible disguises yeah, and nobody yeah, ever yeah. knows. It's kind of like that. They're like, oh, she's got pants on. That must yep. be, mean she's a man. So she wears pants, check, got that. She's also tall for a woman. She's five okay. nine. So she's the same height. And she's probably as the super other strong from carrying freaking pots of water three hundred miles. She's very strong and she's in shape, right? She's got great endurance. Yeah. She also, like you said, has spent the last three years around soldiers. So she knows exactly how to act. She knows how to carry herself. Like she's more comfortable probably acting like a soldier than anything else. So she enlists on her form. She states that she's 22 years old and that her profession is a cook. She passes the eye of all the officers enlisting her, including the physical exam. Okay, so, I was just about to say, like, I ha- where, where is the physical? <laughs> I have some questions about that gentleman's background. Oh, maybe it was like fr- freaking Charlie, who was a entertainer and uh, suddenly became a medic. Is like, I don't know what anatomy is. Yeah, they just like looked at her and they were like, okay, Looks bye. That's good. Maybe she like, you know how sometimes they just have to stand naked and like hold their junk? Maybe like she did. Well, no. Is that an, that is that an official work. military test? It is. <laughs> well, you would know. Your dad served. <laughs> no. <laughs> Walk that back. I'm guessing they probably just looked at them and were like, yeah, they're not sick. So okay, that's fine. What did she do with her top half? Did she bind herself like Mulan? I mean, I have so many questions now. Like, where is she going to the bathroom? Like, I need yes. to know. Yes, yes, that's my question. So she didn't have, she, they actually mentioned that she was very small chested, so she didn't have to okay, bind herself. Helpful. She wore baggy clothes and okay. she probably never had to get undressed for these medical exams. They don't sound that's thorough. So weird. Yeah, clearly. So she passes all the, all the checks. Now I have Mulan soundtrack in my head. Yeah. <laughs> And Kathy Williams, or William Kathy, as she's now known, yeah. is officially a member of the 38th Infantry under the command of Captain Charles Clark. Cool. She's issued a standard uniform, a model 
1966 musket and she's earning $13 a month. Good for you, girl. Is it an all black unit? It is. Un- well, except for Captain Charles, white men okay. would all, all, always be in charge of the all black units. And unbeknownst to the army, this makes Kathy Williams the first woman and the first black woman in the U.S. Army. Wow. How cool. Yep. Now, Kathy has a secret to keep. The only people who know, she has one cousin and one friend who are believed to have maybe been in the same unit. So maybe that helped her kind of conceal it. Like, Yeah, like they would help give her cover like if she had to go. But nobody knows for sure. Pee in the woods. Yeah, exactly. So. Where Kathy's about to go is brutal. She needs to have the strength and endurance, which she knows she has. She has to carry all her own gear, which is about 50 pounds, which she's been doing anyway, right? She also, like you said, she has to hide her body. She also has to hide going to the bathroom. She has to hide her menstrual cycle. Oh, man. You're right. right. She has to make sure that she's never seen naked in a medical exam. Yeah. Yeah. They're also, her unit is thrown into a super violent situation that has no peaceful resolution in sight because between 1860 and 1870, over a million people, mostly white settlers, are going west. Yep. And they are destroying Native American territories and these fights that are breaking out are violent. I hate people. That feels like like my overarching theme of this whole podcast is that I hate people. (laughs) The all black units are named by the Native Americans Buffalo Soldiers. Stop. So these Buffalo Soldiers are defending (gasps) the same people who enslaved them and having to fight Native Americans. It's it's very... Bob Marley. What? Excuse me? Buffalo Soldier. There you go. Wow. It tells the whole story of them. Now I think about the song. Okay. But um, (laughs) I wish they didn't have to. Also... Oh, there's so many problems with this, but continue. Well, well so the, like I said, the Native Americans <sighs> named them Buffalo Soldiers. And it's it's said that the Native Americans actually respected these units more than the all-white units because they were better fighters. Huh. But that's not great for the Native Americans because they're be- they're the ones being attacked. It's not great for anybody. It's not great for anyone, okay? <sighs> this is a bad situation. Just be nice. And these units are faced with discrimination. They are getting oh, hand-me-downs absolutely. from white officers. They're getting broken down or discarded equipment. Remember the movie Glory? I never saw it. <gasps> you got to see it, Denzel. Okay. But these all-black units have the lowest desertion rate. Interesting. Because, hmm. They believe for a couple of different reasons. They believe that these, I mean, this is so close to the Civil War. They believe that these men are coming Most of these men are coming from being slaves. Yeah. So their endurance and their strength. Also, these men are given an opportunity and they they want to take advantage of it. Yeah. In this moment. I also, I'm sure it's like, feels like a family too. That's why I said there's also a much better sense of community within these units than in the all black units rather than the all white units. Kathy enlists. In February of 1867, so not long after she's been there, she gets smallpox. Oh, God. She's hospitalized for months, but she eventually recovers. And when she's released, she has to report for duty at Fort Riley. This is spring of 1867. Now, after getting smallpox, her face is covered in smallpox scars, which actually helps her disguise a little bit. Huh. Right? Because now she doesn't have... Yeah. Her face isn't smooth and she doesn't have to worry about not having facial hair and things like that. Oh, I didn't think about that. Jeez. Yeah. But days after arriving at Fort Riley, Kathy gets what they call the itch, which is a skin infection, and she again has Scabies. to be hospitalized until the middle of May. Oh, boy. Yeah. Now, her company is transferred to Kansas, Fort Harker, right after she's released from the hospital. And by June, Fort Harker has a cholera outbreak. Oh, my God. Yep. Because these, so, I mean, this is so close to the Civil War. These soldiers are facing the same conditions that yeah. the Civil War yeah, soldiers no were, doubt. right, with the diseases. C- Kathy's got to be nervous. She has been nothing but sick since she enlisted, and now she's worried that she might get cholera. She manages to avoid it, but the entire unit is moved to Fort Union in New Mexico. They wow. travel via the Santa Fe Trail on foot, 500 miles. No horses? Well, they probably have horses, but like... Wow. I mean, it's brutal. 
when they reach Fort Union, they're met on the trail before they can enter. They've been traveling 500 miles. And before they can get to the fort to relax, they're met by somebody who says, you can't come in. We're afraid you're the reason everybody has cholera. Oh, my God. Give me a break. I know. More discrimination. So they're forced to go camp out in the woods for three weeks. Oh. Yeah. They're finally allowed into Fort Union. During this time, really the only other women Kathy's seeing are occasionally the wives of other officers. Okay. And then there are also cooks and laundry women like yeah. she was during the Civil War who are around. Now, sometimes those women would engage in sex work to make extra money because they're not paid yeah. a lot at all. And then they would be kicked out for their immoral behavior, but the soldiers would be able to continue. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. I can't do it. Ooh. But Kathy's God. in the South, Southwest for the first time, and she is experiencing something different. People are more open-minded. You have different cultures. You have Native American. You have Hispanic. You have African American. Yeah. You have white. It's different than the South that she <laughs> yeah, was in. for sure. So Kathy's unit is not at Fort Union Long, which is at Fort Union's okay. okay. They're sent to Fort Cummings, which is also in New Mexico, and they have to huh. leave on September 7th. And at this point, the unit's getting – tensions are rising in the unit because they're consistently noticing that they always are forced to be on the move while the all-white units uh, get to stay yeah. at the forts for longer. Oops, they get better nice. lodging. They get better food. They still receive their pay. And the government claims, oh, we're moving you because we've signed the Peace Commission of 1867, which was a peace treaty signed with several Native American tribes. But yeah. it's believed that this unit was still being blamed for the cholera outbreak, even though they weren't the cause of it. God, give it a rest. Yeah. So Kathy's unit arrives to Fort Cummings on October 1st, 1867. Now, this fort is in Apache territory, and it's Ooh. super remote, and it's super isolated. Oh, boy. It's dangerous. FYI, I didn't. I didn't realize this, but at the time Kathy's there, Apache Native Americans were also forced into slavery, and it's believed about 2,000 Apache Native Americans were still slaves at that time. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So Kathy's duties most likely are standing guard, right? Yeah. Patrolling, uh, wood duty, which was incredibly dangerous. You had to travel like 20 miles just to find 20 wood. 20 miles. Mm -hmm. And it was super dangerous because you would leave the you'd leave the fort and then you're yeah. in Apache territory and you could be attacked at any time. Wow. Yeah. The, so they're scouting. They're also given hard labor jobs and they're given hard labor jobs. Uh, her unit and all black units are given hard labor jobs more often than all white units. And so they're doing things like building roads, <sighs> bricklaying, uh, driving wagons. They're they're building the West. Wow. That's incredible. And I mean, awful, but yeah. So, so these racial tensions are building. Like I said, you know, they're noticing. Like they yeah. don't. They're getting all of the bad equipment. They're getting all of the bad assignments. F this. And at the end of 1867, at this Fort Cummings, a white man named Lieutenant Leggett. He has a black female servant named Maddie Merritt. And no. one day, Leggett notices that some money is missing. No. He immediately blames Maddie, even though there's no evidence. Even though she claims that she's innocent. And then she's forcibly searched by several white men. No. Instead of the females on site. And Kathy's unit is furious. Good. Well, Good. then Leggett says that he's also... Destroy them. Leggett says that he's going to exile Maddie, which means he's going to turn her out in the desert alone, which She'll means die. death. Yeah. The unit's not happy. And he can tell that they're not happy. So he starts finding little infractions that he says that they did that he wouldn't normally Dude. have punished them Tell for them or that sleep. he might have made up. And he's starting to publicly punish them, like making them stand on things in front of the rest of the group. Yeah, It's getting really, really tense. So the soldiers meet separately to talk about how to save Maddie and they're not supposed to be meeting about this. They go back and forth. There are several stands, standoffs where nothing actually happens, like threats are made, you know, guns are drawn, but nobody's actually gets in a fight or is injured. But several soldiers eventually are arrested for mutiny, the charge of mutiny, but not Kathy. I have to assume Kathy's probably trying to stay out of the way of this one, even though she yeah. probably doesn't want anything bad to happen. She's also can't be just doesn't want to be discovered. Yeah. They have several 
soldiers that they're charging with mutiny. And the reasonable captain that they like, Captain Clark, has to take these soldiers to be tried, which leaves Leggett behind. And this is when he decides to send Maddie out into the desert. Oh, boy. The remaining soldiers again rally, and they steal Maddie from the guard who's told to escort her out, and they send her somewhere safe. And this Good. is all against orders. Good job. So two additional soldiers are re- arrested, and they are to join Captain Clark to be on trial. The trial goes on for a minute. All of the men except for one are acquitted. The punishment for this is death, by the way. All of the men are acquitted. Thank goodness. One is found guilty, but he's given a prison sentence instead of execution. Okay. But that winter, January 1868, Kathy's unit is getting orders to destroy an Apache village during the winter. The plan is to take all of their resources, which in winter is basically the same as killing an entire village. Oh, absolutely. So it's a dangerous mission for Kathy's unit. One, they're down several men because they've just sent a ton of men to be tried for mutiny. Right. Fucking idiots. Two, their unit was not given sufficient clothing. They don't have coats. Of course. Of yep. course. Three, Leggett is in charge and nobody likes him right now. Someone's got to just take him out. Four, they're supposed to meet up with another unit, but it does not go as planned. To Leggett's credit, he actually retreats and sends everybody back because he's afraid that it's that it's going to be an ambush. So Kathy's unit returns. They have to camp out for days in the cold. Uh, no tents. Coats. No, They're not allowed to light a fire. They don't have the proper clothing. Jeez. It does a number on Kathy's health. But they return yeah. safely back to the fort. FYI, because I know you're probably worried about it. The other group they're supposed to meet with, they get to the village, and the Apache village was deserted. They must have caught wind, and they had left. So Smart. Yeah, they were fine. So in the summer of 1868, the unit is moved again to another fort in New Mexico, and Kathy's health has been struggling since this winter mission. She's been sick yeah. several times. Oh. She's hospitalized that summer for neuralgia. I don't know what that is. It's, like a, it's a nerve damage. Okay. And this is, I mean, how many times has Kathy been hospitalized uh. at this point? It's like number seven. Yeah, so many times. And so she's starting to change her mind. About this whole soldier thing. Yeah, she's like... But you can't leave, right? Well, here's, here's she's, she says, this is a quote, she's tired of army life. Yeah. I have to think she's prob. it's not, it's probably not what she thought it would be. She probably is having some serious moral dilemmas about this as well. It's not the same thing as fighting in the Civil War. Right. You're, like, going on killing, like, families and, like, camps of uh, Native Americans. And she must, I mean, she must be thinking, she's basically having to put her life on the line for, like we said, the white men who enslaved her. You know, I don't think she feels the same about it. But this is all me just talking because she didn't write any of these feelings down. But she's, she kind of is just sick of it. She, her health is failing. She's, you know, she's not being treated fairly. She's in these remote, isolated posts. And she just decides enough is enough. So she joined the Army for Independence, and she realizes, I can be independent in other ways. You know, she has a bunch of skills now, and she's been exposed to the Southwest. She likes the area. So on her next doctor visit, she just doesn't even try to hide anything. I don't know if she stripped down or what, but they're like, oh, my God, you're a woman. (laughs) She just (gasps) is like, yep. But now she's going to get in trouble. She should have just ran. She doesn't even get in trouble. They just discharge her. I know. She was trying to hide it for so long. The unit finds out that Kathy's a woman because news travel fast. This this is yeah. the first. There have been women who have done this before, but this is like the first time that it's been officially on record and she's okay. made it through as an actual soldier. All the men in her unit were furious, which I think is so unfair. She said, the men all wanted to get rid of me after they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me. Mm, that sucks. And so William Kathy was discharged. October 14th, 1868. Wow. Now, once she's discharged, she has to travel back. She travels back to Fort Union, and she travels alone, by the way. Oh, my gosh. I know. She becomes a cook for a colonel and his family all the way through 1870, and she saves enough money, and she moves to Colorado. Oh, it's a nice place to live. She works as a, a washerwoman for a while. She also gets married in Colorado. Oh, good for you. Well, the man that oh. she marries steals everything that she no. worked for. She'd been saving a lot of money. She even had no. her own 
horses and her own wagon. She's worked he takes, so hard. He takes everything. And you know what she does? Ugh. She has him arrested. Yeah. Yeah. And he does jail time. Good. And while he's in jail, she says, eh, I think I might get out of this town <laughs> before he yeah. gets out. So Good she idea. leaves and that's it for her. She never gets married again. So she leaves and, you know, Jerkface is still in jail. She's constantly making money as a cook or as a washwoman, and she ends up in Trinidad, Colorado for years. Uh huh. She leaves for a, f- a few years to go back to New Mexico, but then she ultimately ends back up in Trinidad. Now, in 1890, Kathy becomes sick again, and she's hospitalized for almost an entire year. Wow. Think of those bills. I know. Sadly, all of her toes are amputated due to diabetes oh. during this hospital stay. And when she's released, she's has to walk with a crutch. So she can no longer do the manual labor that she's been oh. doing her whole life to survive, like cook yeah. and wash women. She doesn't have a way to support herself. She's only 47 at this time. I feel like she's only 47, but she's lived like yeah, she's, lifetimes already. Yeah. Well, it's also the 1800s. I mean, 47 and 1890 <laughs> yeah. is, yeah. you know. <laughs> so she has no way to support herself. And she's very proud of the time that she served. She should be. They're not even counting the time that she was forced to serve, right? Those three and a half years. Of course not. So she files for benefits in the summer of 1891. Her claim is fully refused. Shocking. Mm-hmm. And with her claim being refused, Kathy has no way to support herself. There is no record of Kathy past April of 1892. It's believed that she died shortly after her claim was refused simply because she wow. had had no means of help. Mm. Now, on July 22nd, 2016, a monument was dedicated to Kathy in Kansas because she is the only known female Buffalo soldier to serve in the U.S. Army. Wow. And this is the same city in Kansas that has a full statue of a Buffalo soldier that was dedicated to the troops in 1992. Wow. What a woman. I know. And her and Pauline were on the same battlefields. They died around the same time. Yeah. And they both had these sad yeah. existences Endings. after their service. Yeah. What do you think of Kathy? I really like her. I really, I mean, it's just amazing. Like, just being a soldier is hard, but, like, having to, like, pretend to be somebody else that whole time like that's exhausting like she but like who's surprised like a black woman like back then like had have to work so much harder for just anything and it's just incredible like her strength and her discipline and focus is just mine like think how hard I, I can't imagine what a life yeah unbelievable and one of the, the book I read about her it was said that her kind of, I don't know what they would be called, but basically like reviews from her commanding officers, Uh they just kind of, they didn't see her as any kind of standout. They kind of just thought of her as somebody who does work, but she wasn't any kind of standout soldier. And the author of the book says, well, yeah, she was, Kathy was most likely playing up a stereotype to be invisible when really they didn't know how cunning and deceptive she was actually being and like how intelligent she had to be to pull that off. And be able to fool all of them. So she didn't want any of that special attention. Right, so she right. she Can't just kept her head down. down and did what she was told because she didn't want to let on that she was super smart. <laughs> because then, you know, she would be a standout and then she's going to yep. rise through the ranks and yep. then there's going to be more attention on her. Wow. Wow. What a story. It's crazy, like, that this doesn't have more attention to it. Because this is a pretty crazy story. I know. And like a first. Yeah. There were several. They they said that there are several women in the Civil War who were discovered to be soldiers who had disguised uh-huh. themselves. But they don't think that Kathy knew that and that this was something that she did independently simply to provide for herself and have wow. something that she was proud of. She was really yeah. proud of her service. She should be. Yeah. Wow. What a woman. Incredible. Yep. So that is Pauline Cushman and Kathy Williams both fought in the Civil War in different ways. And the Civil War is just the fact that two thirds died from diseases. The fact that that those women just survived not getting dysentery. I mean, Kathy Williams survived smallpox, for God's sakes. I know. I was expecting her to die from that. I know. I was worried. But there you go. I wanted to give you something uplifting. I love it. 
I wish that their lives had ended yeah. a little nicer, but yeah. I think that's a good lesson for us today, right? try to help people when while they're matters. alive don't yeah who cares about honoring somebody with a full military right. funeral after they're if they're, they're dead let's try to take care of those yeah. people while they're here it, exactly exactly i feel like we see that a lot um like think about when it matters like maybe do a little survey of what's going on right now and hey can we can we boost this person or help that person just speaking today like veteran affairs are really tough in the u.s and yeah like, how can we get better at that and how could we do yeah. more for these people who did so much for us yeah 100 percent. well do you have any last words for today yes i think they're probably repetitive but one i hate people two cool. the best time to be alive is today oh shoot i meant to earmuff you and call that out i knew you were gonna say that today <laughs> I mean, think, I was just thinking about it when she went through like those seven diseases back to back yeah. to back. Yes. It was hell living back then. Yeah. Hell. Like people like to romanticize it and like, no, bro, it was disgusting and terrible and everybody's sick and you die young. And she's hospitalized in a hospital that is not competent enough to know that she's a woman. So think about the care that she's getting. I just kept thinking <laughs> yeah. about that. I'm like, That's a great did point. anybody give her a sponge bath or That's like a great point? Oh my did goodness. Anybody like help, help no. her at any point? Right. How do you not then encounter think how that? She is if she didn't get a sponge bath. Well, I also wonder, I wonder if there weren't nurses who did know. I was thinking the same thing. And just shut up about it. Yeah. And thought, good for you. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that too just now. Go get them, Kathy. Go get them, Kathy. I would love – I wish Kathy had written down her own story. I know. She she couldn't – Could she read and she write? She couldn't read or write, no. No. So I wish we had known, like, Ugh. were there people along the way who – Right, who helped. Discovered and just kept it quiet? Were there tense <sighs> moments where she was almost it's discovered? Yeah, I can't imagine. God, we, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's just like being a soldier is hard, but another layer, like how exhausting to constantly pretend like, yeah. And like be on alert. Like you can't really relax. No, exactly. Yeah. You're always on alert. Like every oh. time, every time she had to go to the bathroom, she's on alert, you know? Maybe she <laughs> just didn't drink a lot of water. No, that is actually what this book said, that a lot of women who did this, they would often make sure to have meager water yeah. even though they're on these hot trails Ugh. because they wanted to make sure they limited their bathroom trips jeez that's just crazy to think about that oh wow well this is great more of these yeah all right i'll get to it and i love learning more about the civil war like you you know you know all the battles and like it was a terrible war but like you don't, like I said, you don't really learn about the subterfuge that goes on. So yeah, cool. I know. Like you said, I never really thought about Civil War spies mm -mm. in terms of females. And yeah, I had never heard of Kathy Williams, which is such a bummer. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's crazy <laughs> that, we ha that she's not like a big person to learn about during the Civil War portion of our history class. And, you know, I, I think it's partly because she wasn't involved in any huge battles. Yeah. And her life just kind of disappear towards the end. Yeah. And to me, that's all the more reason to talk about her. Right. She did something unbelievable. She was the, the first woman and the first black woman in the U.S. Army, and y'all didn't Incredible. even know. <laughs> Incredible. Like, she did it. I mean, think of that decision. She thought, I want something more. Yeah. And here's what I'm going to do. she just, like, did this crazy, brave thing. I could, yeah. The ovaries on that woman, I'll tell you. Exactly. Exactly right. All right. Well, you can find us on all the platforms at... Tea Time Crimes. You can email us at... Tea Time Crimes at gmail.com. That was slippery elm voice right there. <laughs> and rate, review, like, subscribe. Yeah. Please leave a review before Alana tell loses your friends. her mind. Yep. And who should listen today? Soldiers. Of all kinds, especially thank you for your female. Service. Yeah, yes, thank you. Especially female soldiers, um, history buffs, Civil War buffs. Like, make sure your teachers, history teachers, don't listen too closely though, because there's a little bit of TTC history along with TTC math. You know, I mean, like, just enjoy the story. Yeah, it's a story, <laughs> but like, the big thing is involve these women into your books and yes, your, into your classrooms. Your yeah, yes, and Mulan. You want Mulan to listen? 
Yeah. She could really identify with it. The the Disney Mulan or like the real one? I mean, she's she, yeah, she was based on a real woman, but yeah. she's she's dead now. Yeah. But well, she did great. It, the 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 thing I remember she most did from great. the real story is that once she had a baby, she went right back on her horse and she tied the umbilical cord to her like flagpole and they like they would laugh about it. That's Stop the it. Biggest yeah, that's the biggest thing I remember from that book. <laughs> When I had a baby, I almost <laughs> bled out in a hospital bed yeah. drinking a juice box. So yep. I don't think that I am up to Mulan <laughs> caliber. <laughs> that is so sad. Oh, Mulan, I don't know how you did it. Go, But she she did that with joy. With, well, I bet she did it with a little bit of burning pain. Oh, but. absolutely. But like they'd be like laugh at it flapping in the wind, her and her man. Anyway. <laughs> Please don't Milan? talk about things flapping in the wind. Take a listen. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know ghosts love our podcast. Yeah, that's true. Enjoy it, Mulan. We really support you, and you're very inspiring as well. Yep. yep. All right. Well, we will All be right. back next week. <laughs> on that note. going to walk away from this one. Yeah. On body parts flapping in the wind. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Goodbye.